can we zoom in and talk about COVID-19 virus? Sure. I don't know what your preferred name is, but- Well, maybe there's two names, right? The virus is SARS-CoV-2, yeah. which is hard, it's long, right? And then COVID-19 is the disease. So you could say the virus of COVID-19, that's fine. The virus know. of COVID-19. But for the purpose of this conversation, we'll every once in a while just say COVID. It's fine, no <laughs> problem. What, what is this virus from, uh, I don't know how many ways we can talk about it. I think from a basic structural, like the uh, the Varian structure, biological structure perspective, mm -hmm. what is it? What are its variants? Can you describe the basics, the okay. important characteristics of the virus? So viruses are classified by humans just to make it easier to keep track of them, yeah. right? So this is a coronavirus, which is because when they were first discovered, I think the first ones were animal coronaviruses. They looked at them under the electron microscope and it looked like the solar corona. And that's all there is to it. And I have to say that early in the outbreak, the, the place with the highest seropositivity in the US for a while, 68% was a working class neighborhood in New York City called Corona. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you beat that, right? That's crazy, yeah. So coronaviruses, they have membranes, right? We talked about membranes. They have spike proteins in the membrane so they can attach to cells. And inside, they have RNA. And they are the viruses with the longest RNA that we know of. No, none other comes close. For some reason, they're able to maintain 30,000. So SARS-CoV-2 RNA is 30,000 bases of RNA. And some of the other coronas are even longer. 40,000. This is a, fa uh, coronas are a family of viruses yes. that included the, what, the, the one you mentioned before, version one. <laughs> so SARS-CoV-1, yeah. CoV-1, and I guess other ones as so well. So the first, we first learned of them in animals, a lot of animals, pigs and um, cows and horses have coronaviruses. And then uh, in the 60s, we discovered a couple of human coronaviruses that just cause colds, very mild colds that you wouldn't even think twice about, right? And then suddenly in 20, 2003, there's this outbreak of severe respiratory disease in, in China. And, you know, they it started in November and they didn't tell the world until February. And that was really bad because it was already spreading by the time they told people about it. But this went to many, 29 different countries. Only 8,000 people were infected and then it stopped. And that was the first time we saw an epidemic coronavirus. And it, what they did afterwards is they said, okay, it looks like it came from the meat markets. They have live meat markets in Guangzhou in the south of China where you can go and pick out an animal and the guy will slaughter it for you and give it to you. And then of course there's blood everywhere and that's how they got infected. And they figured out that there's this animal called a palm civet that was the source of virus. The palm civets are shipped in from the countryside and they, the palm civets somehow in the countryside got it from a bat. So mm -hmm. they went looking in caves in the countryside and they found in one cave all the viruses that could make up SARS-1. And that was 2000 and well, I would say took about five, eight years uh, after that outbreak. So that was the first hint that bats have coronaviruses that can infect people and cause problems, right? And after that, we should have been ready. So didn't they already start developing vaccines after yes. then? So some people started making vaccines. They tested them in, in mice, um, but they never got into people. And some people started working on antiviral drugs. Nothing ever came of them because, you know, industry, there's no there's no disease, it's gone. Why should we make vaccines and drugs? And NIH in the US, you submit a grant and they say, ah, it's too risky. There's no none of this virus around. So people were really short-sighted because I always say we could have had antivirals for this. Absolutely, yeah, for sure, no question. In fact, one the one antiviral that's in phase three, it's called molnupiravir. It's the only one that you can take orally. It's a pill. Mm -hmm. It looks really good. That was developed five years ago but never taken into humans. It could have been ready. So we dropped the ball. And then the next decade, 2012, MERS coronavirus comes, uh, comes up in the Arabian Peninsula. This comes from camels and infects people, but probably the camels got it from bats originally mm -hmm. some time ago. 
but that never transmits from person to person, very rarely. Mm -hmm. Every new little outbreak is a new infection from a camel. So that was 2012, and now here we are, 2019, a new outbreak of respiratory disease in China, and this one really goes all over the world where, where SARS-1 could not. And it's a coronavirus. You know, it's different enough from SARS-1 that it has very different properties. But it still has a membrane. It still has a very long RNA in the middle. Right. And then it still has the spike proteins. That's right. What are the things that are, what are the little unique things that make it that much more effective? Well, that make it cause a pandemic of pandemic. millions of people as opposed to SARS-1. Yeah. Well, the genome is... 20% different from SARS-1, say. And in those bases, there's some, there are things that uh, make it different from SARS-1. It binds the same receptor, ACE2, on the cell surface. So that's remarkable. Um, it has a lot of the same proteins. They look similar. Like if you look at the structure of the spikes, they look similar, but there's enough amino acid differences to, to make the bio. And what it is, we don't know because uh, how do you figure that out? You need to study animals because you can't infect people. And the, the animal models aren't great. You know, for, for, for so the way you figure that out is you figure out how those differences, what functional, like how the difference in the amino acids lead to functional difference of the virus. That's like right. how it attaches, That's how right. it breaks the cell wall. Exactly. And sure. how the hell do you figure that out? Like, I guess there's models so of you, interaction. You, you need a, first you need an animal of some kind to infect, right? You can use mice, people have used ferrets, guinea pigs, non-human primates, all of the above. Non-human primates are very expensive, so not many people do that. Um, and then you can put the virus in the respiratory tract. But in fact, none of them get sick like people do. You know, Many people with, with COVID get a mild disease, but 20% get a very severe, longer lasting disease, and they can die from it, right? No animal does that yet. So we have no insight into what's controlling that. But if you just want to look at the very first part of infection and the shedding and the transmission, you can do it in any one of several animal models. Ferrets are really good for transmission. They tend they have nasal structures like humans, and they, they you can put them in cages next to each other, and they'll transmit the virus really nicely. So you can study that. Ooh. But the other thing that's important that we should mention is how do you manipulate these viruses? So these are RNA viruses. You can't manipulate RNA. We don't know how to do it. But we, DNA, because of the recombinant DNA revolution that occurred in the 70s, we can change DNA any way we want. Mm -hmm. We can change a single base. We can cut out bases. We can put other things in really easily. And if I may give it a personal aspect. When I went to MIT as a postdoc in 1979, David Baltimore said, here's what I want you to do. The, the moratorium on recombinant DNA experiments on viruses has just been lifted. I want you to make a DNA copy of polio and see if you put that in a cell, whether it will start an infection. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, I made a DNA copy of poliovirus. It's only 7,500 bases. It's much smaller than corona. And I took that DNA and I put it in a piece of DNA from a bacteria called a plasmid. Mm -hmm. And you can grow plasmids in many, many bacteria, make lots of them and purify the DNA really easily. And I took that DNA and I, I sequenced it because we wanted we didn't know the genome sequence of polio at the time. And that took me a year, by the way, because the techniques we had were really archaic. And nowadays you could do it in 15 minutes, right? It's amazing. And I took the DNA, I put it into cells and out came polio. So that's the start. Now, since then, everybody has taken that technique and used it for their virus. You can now do it with SARS-CoV-2. You make a DNA copy of any RNA virus, you can modify it and you put it back into cells and you'll get vi your modified virus out. So that's an important part of understanding the properties of the virus is say in an animal. By changing the virus, you're changing a DNA copy, you're making the virus then and putting it into the animal. Uh, can you clarify, so even in the RNA virus, you can take and turn it into DNA? Yes. And then we that can. allows you to modify it. Yes. 
So the, uh, what's take, that? What's that uh, mapping? What, what, no, no, no. What's the process of going from RNA to DNA? Reverse transcription. That's reverse transcription. Right. Oh, so you actually go into the the process of reverse transcription to do this? Yes. Yeah, so oh. remember, David Baltimore and Howard yes. had discovered this enzyme in the seventies, and they got the Nobel Prize for that. And when I went to David's lab at MIT, he had the enzyme in the freezer. He said, "Here, take this and make a DNA copy of polio." Yeah, I didn't ma make the connection that you can use that kind of thing yeah. for an RNA virus, and so that's and then modify it. See, any DNA virus already exists as DNA, so you can modify it. That's yeah. no, but for RNA viruses, it was difficult. And so then from that point on, for influenza, every other RNA virus and coronaviruses, people made DNA copies, and that's what they used to modify and, and ask questions about what things are doing, right? What's right. this gene doing? What so if we take it out? What happens? Can you do the same thing with uh, COVID? Uh, is is take the RNA and then... Of course. And in fact, in January 20... 20, as soon as the genome sequence was released from China, the labs all over were synthesizing this 30,000 base DNA mm -hmm. and getting what, virus. What can you figure out without infecting anything? Just uh, turning into, with the reverse transcription, turning into DNA, modifying stuff, and then putting it into a cell. What can you figure out from that? Oh, well, you could, well, let's say you you can cut out a gene. You see some genes in the sequence. I don't know what these genes do. Let's Let cut see. them out. And then you could cut them out of the DNA. You put the DNA in cells and maybe you get virus out. And you go, oh, that, clearly that gene's not needed mm -hmm. for the virus to reproduce, at least in cells, right? Or maybe you take the gene out and the, you never get any virus. So it's lethal. Is there it. a nice systematic ways of doing this? Do people yes. kind of automate it? Absolutely. And we, I mean, the problem with sars the COVID virus is it's 30,000 bases. So There's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. And what makes it more difficult is that you have to, it's been classified as a BSL-3 agent, biosafety level three. And so not everyone has a lab that's capable of doing that. So it limits the number of people who can do experiments. You know, some, we, we're lucky to have a few in New York City, but not every place has them. So you cannot work with the virus just out on the bench like we do with many other viruses. You have to wear a suit and have to have special procedures and containment and so forth. So it makes it difficult to do basic experiments on the virus. But when it's a pandemic, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of incentive to work on it harder. So. And also you don't need to work on the virus. You can take bits of it and work. You could take, say, just the spike, right? And say, can we make a vaccine with just the spike? Because right. that doesn't require BSL-3. So yes. So uh, like building a vaccine requires you to figure out how, or antiviral drugs, how to attack various structural parts of the virus and the functional parts of the virus. Right. You have to decide on a target. Yeah. Like I'm gonna make an antiviral, what am I gonna target in the virus? And there are a few things that make more sense than others. Usually we like to target enzymes. I don't know if you remember any, your biochemistry, but you know, enzymes are catalytic. You don't need a lot of them to do a lot of things. So they're typically in low concentrations in, in a virus infected cell. So it's easier to inhibit them with a drug. And the, the coronas have a couple of enzymes that we can target. So it's you have to figure that out ahead of time and decide what to go after. And then you can look for drugs that inhibit what, what you're interested in. It's not that hard to do. There's just something beautiful about biology, about the mechanisms of biology. And I kind of regret um, falling in love with computer science so much that I um, left that biology textbook on the shelf mm. and left it behind. But uh, hopefully we'll return to it now because I think one of the things you learn even in computer science that studying biology and uh, certainly neurobiology, uh, you you get inspired here's a mechanism of incredible complexity that works really well, is very robust, is very effective, efficient. Mm -hmm. It inspires you to come up with techniques that you can engineer in the machine. So that's that's the what drives the field forward when people improvise and come up with new technologies that really make a difference. And we have we have a bunch of those now.